Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to Daniel's Anatomy. Today's our uh, topic is mammary gland. So we will try to deal the mammary gland. So in the previous session we were uh, talking about the pectoral region. So we have reflected the skin, superficial fascia. Superficial fascia includes the mammary gland also and uh, then we have reflected the deep fascia then the other modifications also we have studied with the clavi pectoral fascia then from a deep fascia is called as pectoral fascia in the axilla is called as axillary fascia then we went into the muscles of the pectoral region pectoralis major minor and subclavis with their origin insertion of supplement action in continuation of that one, so we are going to deal mammary gland is otherwise also called as a normal dermologist breast. So what is the definition of the <coughs> mammary gland? So in general in our body we have two types of glands called as sebaceous glands and sweat glands. So now this is categorized under sweat gland out of that that is a modified sweat gland. So it helps in some secretions. So what all those secretions we will try to deal by the slides. And uh, mammary gland is present in both males and females. But in males it is a non-functional means rudimentary. But in females it is functional that we can term them as well developed and functional in females. So as we are already done with the pectoral region, so hope you will understand very clearly now where it is going to be situated. It is situated in the pectoral region. As I said, it is present in the superficial fascia. Very, very important to be remembered. So when you study the next slides about the external features and parts of the mammary gland, so you will listen a word on, you are going to term a word called as a tail of spins so under a mammary gland so except the tail of spins all the parts of the mammary gland is located in the superficial fascia after superficial fascia who should be present deep fascia so now the tail of spins is now entering into the deep fascia it is located in the deep fascia so while passing from superficial fascia to deep fascia they passes through a foramen the name of the foramen is called as axillary tail of spins is now piercing the deep fascia through what foramen of langer so please try to uh, remember the key important points so in the Superficial fascia who is present? Mammary gland. And uh, mammary gland part that is tail of spins is uh, located in where? Deep fascia. How the tail of spins is going into the deep fascia? Through a foramen. What is the name of the foramen? Foramen of Langer. So now when you take up the mammary gland, so we draw it in a circular fashion but a little bit mammary gland which is extending so now this is called as the tail of spins axillary tail of spin so now where i am going to keep a dot at this level you are going to find out a foramen called as foramen of langer so now this is our mammary gland this is the axillary tail of a spins this dotted area is called as what a foramen of langer so this part is located in the superficial fascia and this is located in the deep fascia so this is what is the difference where you need to remember <coughs> so try to observe here we are removed the skin and uh, we could able to fascias then immediately we'll identify in the previous session we have spoke what is the name of the muscle pectoralis major muscle so now try to observe here in the females one <coughs> in the superficial fascia which is going to be located here which is in the superficial fascia so now this is called as the mammary gland and where it is extending into the axilla into the deep fascia so now this is called as axillary 
tail of spins which I have told you in the previous slide. And at this level it passes through a foramen called as foramen of Langer. So next coming to the <coughs> mammary gland or breast. So from where all to it is going to be located. So we have studied the bony skeleton. So in the midline of the body we are going to have is called as water. Sternum is going to be located. Sternum is attached by water. Ribs are going to be located. They are attached through the costal cut. So now how many pairs of ribs do we have? We have 12 on the right and 12 on the left. So 12 pairs of ribs are going to be located. So the vertical extent is from 2 to 6 ribs. So now to understand at the midline you are going to have is called as the sternum in the midline to be remembered. So when you see the sternum in the midline, here also when you see the sternum in the midline, we had ribs, so 12 pairs of ribs are there. So from the second rib, then third, fourth, fifth and sixth rib. So now this extent is called as the vertical extent to be remembered. So please try to remember the vertical extent. So, so this is from the second to the sixth rib is the vertical extent. Here also try to remember. So almost from second to sixth. From second to sixth is the vertical extent. The next statement try to see the horizontal extent from the sternum to the mid axillary line. So now this is the sternum and now this is the axilla. In the axilla try to draw a line directly downward. So this is called as the mid axillary line. So from the sternum to mid axillary line you draw. So now this is horizontal you are drawing. So now this is called as your horizontal extent. So let me show you in this slide. So from the sternum the mammary gland has started towards to the what is this line mid axillary line. So now this is the horizontal <coughs> extent where we have to remember. So in closure so vertical extent is from 2 to 6 ribs. Horizontal is from the sternum to the mid axillary line to be remembered. So this is the way we have to remember. So next shapes of the mammary glands are <coughs> variable in shape. So they might be hemispherical in shape, conical in shape, pyriform in shape, pendulous in shape, flattened in shape. So different shapes you could able to find it out. And then we are moving on with the quadrants of the mammary gland. So now this is the right side mammary gland which we have drawn over here. So now this is the circle where you are going to make, this one is called as what? Foramen of Langer. So automatically this is called as what? Axillary tail of spins. And remaining part of the mammary gland you are going to divide into four different quadrants. So now this is the area where you are going to divide the mammary gland into four quadrants. So now this is called as the superomedial quadrant and now this one is called as the inferomedial quadrant because at this level what should be there sternum should be there so sternum immediately superomedially and inferomedially then you had is called as what superolateral quadrant and now this one is called as the inferolateral quadrant. How many quadrants you have? Superomedial, inferomedial, superolateral and inferolateral quadrant. And this is an extension to the deep fascia that is called as the axillary tail of spells. The same diagram when you could able to uh, look in over here. So now when you see the quadrant, so automatically this will becomes what? Superomedial. What will this will becomes? This will becomes the inferomedial. This will becomes what? Superolateral. This will become so what? Inferolateral quadrants because we are going to take the landmark of the sternum in the midline to be remembered. <coughs> so with that I am done with the uh, quadrants also. Then we will try to study the past external features of the mammary gland. So now we will study them under three subheadings as skin, parenchyma and the stroma. 
so skin consists of metal and areola so when you take out the outermost feature so anywhere as i told you in anatomy first layer comes out is the skin so now the skin includes nipple and areola so now this is the area where you have to understand that skin is surrounded by so now this all is the skin so they are surrounded by the nipple and the other area is called as the areola to be remember so we will try to study the nipple now so nipple is a conical projection in the skin it is almost situated at the fourth intercostal space later on session we will try to talk about the intercostal space then we will say that we had 12 ribs are there so between ribs we are going to have the gaps or spaces i call them as intercostal space which is going to filled by the corresponding muscles so now the between first rib and second rib the gap is called as first intercostal space between second and third rib i call them as second intercostal space between third rib and fourth rib i call them as third intercostal space between fourth rib and fifth rib i call them as fourth intercostal space like us parallelly when we had 12 pairs of ribs how many intercostal spaces do we have 11 pairs of intercostal spaces we have so now exactly the nipple is now located in the Level at the level of the fourth intercostal space. So now, what is the importance of the nipple to be studied? So now it is going to be receiving, or it is going to be pierced by fifteen to twenty lactiferous ducts. So try to observe over here. There are ducts are coming here, right? The green color one, violet. Green color, green color. All these green color ones are called as the lactiferous ducts. They contain. They are made up of muscle, strong muscle, and smooth muscle. Then they are highly sensitive because they are supplied by the sensory nerves. So, how the lactiferous ducts are going to form? So, in the upcoming slides, also I will be explaining you. So, they are having how many? Fifteen to twenty lactiferous ducts. Please try to remember this number. So now. Uh, please try to understand so now this is the nipple so in this nipple what should be present 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts are going to be located so next point nipple we are done so now we are going on with the next line that is called as the areola to be remembered <coughs> so what about the areola to be studied so now here it is a circular pigmented blackish area around the nipple so now this area is called as the areola so here also this area is called as areola and this surrounding area and this surrounding area it contains plenty of modified sebaceous glands so can you try to identify the dots here so these are all are plenty of sebaceous modified sebaceous gland these dots all these things so these are going to be enlarged during the pregnancy and these enlargements i name them as what tubercles of montgomery they are going to be called as what tubercles of montgomery and they are going to secrete the secretion some um, secretion they secretes and uh, <coughs> when the baby suckles the milk from the mother so the areola cannot be nipple cannot be cracked in you know, a because these tubercles of montgomery will secretes the secretion that is going to lubricate the skin and uh, prevents cracking of the skin over the nipple an important point to be remembered is like they it is not having superficial fascia which is filled with the fat so that's why we say that devoid devoid means what absence of hair and absence of fat in the areola so now when they are been contracted this is how the areola and the nipple looks contracted and how in normal so it is the relax so this is all about the the areola to be remembered and then moving on with the next level so means in this slide i have told you that we are have skin parenchyma stroma now we are done with the skin skin includes what nipple i have explained areola i have explained so next we will we are moving on with the parenchyma and stroma together we will try to go in so try to see the parenchyma so parenchyma includes three sub parts that are going to be located so that is the glandular part fibrous part and 
fatty part glandular part fibrous part and fatty part to be remembered so now how we will deal one by one so first uh, we'll try to look into the fibrous part so that that will be more easy enough so that you will understand <coughs> so the fibrous part consists of uh, consists of fibrous septa which is extending from the skin into the pectoral fascia and divides into 15 to 20 lobes by suspensory ligament of cooper which anchors the skin and the gland of a pectoral fascia what does this explains over here so let me put on a diagram over here so that you will understand very clearly over here so now i am drawing a mammary gland over here and at the center you have nipple surrounded by areola is going to be present so now here uh, it uh, explains for us to say that uh, we are going to divide by this is one suspensory ligament of cooper second suspensory ligament third suspensory ligament fourth suspensory fifth sixth seventh likewise so on <coughs> i am going to have 15 to 20 lobes which are separated by what suspensory ligament of cooper so now the green color one is called as suspensory ligament of cooper so now I have got one lobe. So the name of the how many number of lobes you are going to have. So try to remember 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So like how many number of lobes you should have? 15 to 20 lobes you need to have. So 15 to 20 lobes are being formed by a fibrous septa. The fibrous septa is by what? suspensory ligament of cooper which has divided the mammary gland into see this is one lobe second lobe third lobe fourth fifth sixth seventh eight nine ten eleven twelve likewise we are going to divide them into lobes by suspensory ligament of cooper which is extending from where outermost skin from the skin level try to see the gray uh, this uh, pinkish color shaded area. from the skin it is going to extend it deep inside so these are all are called as what suspensory ligaments of Cooper. Second level is called as the <coughs> glandular part to be remembered. So when you see the glandular part, so the glandular tissue consists of a milk secreting unit. So now this is one milk secreting unit. So in every gland, you it means like uh, at every level, you are going to identify the milk secreting unit to be remembered. So please try to understand. So we will draw one milk secreting unit. We will draw one milk secreting unit. So ultimately, it states over here that it consists of how many lobes? We already know 15 to 20 lobes are there. In every lobe, what you have to understand here is like lacticiferous ducts. Can you recall my previous statement? When you studied the nipple, we said that there is an important word. How many ducts are there you had? 15 to 20 ducts are there. So now how many lobes you are going to have now? 15 to 20 lobes. Means every lobe should have how many uh, these structures to be present um, lacticiferous ducts so one one duct so that is what I have mentioned over here uh, each and every green color one is ending over here so now we will try to extend over here so uh, we are receiving one lacticiferous duct another lacticiferous duct lacticiferous duct so at the towards to the nipple we are going to identify so this is the area where you have to identify so now, to understand, each lobe consists of lacticiferous duct that is surrounded by a cluster of alveoli and they are going to form the alveolar duct to the lacticiferous sinus. And uh, lacticiferous sinus is a dilation near its termination. What all it explains? Try to observe over here. So now this is the area where nipple and areola level so what you should have lacticiferous duct 1 2 3 4 we could able to identify so try to identify here also 1 2 3 4 5 magnified picture of the same thing so before that the lacticiferous duct is going to form they are surrounded by what cluster of 
alveoli. These are all are what milk secreting units. So try to observe. So at every lobe, in every 15 to 20 lobe, you will identify the cluster of alveoli. All the alveoli will converge and now they are going to form the, an important word that is called as what? Alveolar duct. Can you see the duct here? Every alveolus is ending with a duct, smaller, smaller branching. So those are called as what? Alveolar. So now here it states that they are surrounded by a cluster of alveoli and forms what? Alveolar duct. So now here alveoli is there. Alveolar duct is there for every <coughs> uh, segment of a lobe. And finally, they drains into a lacticiferous sinus. What is lacticiferous sinus? It is a dilation at the termination. So now finally, all the alveolar ducts has came over here. So try to see here. So now these are all our alveolar ducts. So now, this is also alveolar duct, alveolar duct, alveolar duct, alveolar duct. Try to check it out here from every lobe. Finally, alveolar duct, alveolar duct, alveolar duct, alveolar duct. At the termination, they are going to have a dilation. So that dilation is called as what? Lacticiferous. So here we have to put a dilation. So this dilation is called as what? Lacticiferous sinus. And these lacticiferous sinus acts as a reservoir of milk during lactation. So now here is the point to be remembered that so in the female's mammary gland, in every female where the onset of age, the mammary gland as usually develops. But once the pregnancy initiates only, the milk secreting unit will start functioning. So if, uh, if the pregnancy onset of phase it has not occurred, so the just mammary gland has developed, but the uh, milk secreting unit was not functional. Once it was functional during the thing, so that procedure of formation of milk is called as lactation. So now milk gets uh, secreted and they were being stored at where? They were being stored at the lacticiferous sinus. Once the baby comes and suckles the mother's uh, nipple, then only contraction and relaxation of longitudinal smooth muscles that are present in the nipple will help the milk to be uh, ejected from the lacticiferous sinus to the uh, feeding of the baby. So this is what you have to understand. It is not mandatory that every female uh, uh, gland is functional. Only when the onset of a pregnancy takes place only, it can be remembered. All lacticiferous ducts converge towards to the nipple and open into it. So this is what is about the glandular phase. So means like to understand over here. So we had 15 to 20 lobes. So all are been separated by whom? Suspensory ligament of Cooper. Then in every lobe we are going to have what? Cluster of alveoli. So these are all are what? <coughs> Cluster of the alveoli. All these alveoli are now going to form what? Uh, they are all these alveoli. These alveoli will end as alveolar ducts. All the alveolar ducts will converge to, uh, to form what? Lacticiferous uh, ducts are going to be formed. And they are going to be ended by a sinus called as what? Lacticiferous sinus and opens into the nipple of the female. So this is all about the statement of what we have studied that is the uh, glandular part. So now we are moving on with the next one. So uh, the whole of the gland. So here in this uh, picture you could able to identify this is the alveoli, alveoli, alveoli. So lot of things you identify and how the alveolar duct is coming and lacticiferous duct is reaching over here. They are being uh, enclosed by a fat that is called as the fatty part to be remembered. So now we are going to talk about the third part that is called as the fatty part to be studied. So now to check it over here, the, it is the main bulk of the gland. So the shape of the mammary gland will be decided by the amount of the fat that is going to be located. It is distributed all over the mammary gland. Except what level you don't identify the fat, except at the areola and the nipple, the fat is absent. But remaining all the area, the fat is going to be located. So this fat is now going to make the uh, organ uh, 
contour means like shape introductory slide we have studied hemispherical shape conical shape flat and shape, different types of shapes we have studied right so all the shapes could be decided by the amount of the fatty stroma that is going to be associated to be uh, remembered with that uh, we are done with the external features and parts for the mammary gland and now we are moving on to the relations of the gland so when you talk about the uh, relations of the gland to be remembered superficial relations and deep relations so generally the gland is superficially related by the skin and superficial fascia behind the gland that is a deep relation so behind the gland so they were being traversed by a lot of blood vessels and limbs are going to be traversed so that i am going to mention them as retro mammary space retro means behind retro means behind the mammary gland there is a space called the retro mammary space where the blood vessels are getting passing through so due, due to this space only we could able to say that actually what we have to understand mammary gland is located in which fascia superficial fascia so behind what fascia should be present deep fascia so deep fascia is called as what um, as we already know pectoral fascia so now the mammary gland is getting separated from the deep fascia so between the mammary gland and the deep fascia you had a space that is called as the retro mammary space so now this is the skin this is the superficial fascia this is the deep fascia in the superficial fascia who is going to be located mammary gland is located so between the mammary gland and the deep fascia so you had retro mammary space so that due to this space only the mammary gland and the breast that can be freely move over the pectoralis major if the normal female is healthier and functional so the mammary gland is freely movable on the uh, pectoralis major if so these sort of things are uh, non movable you need to need to find a clinician so that what things needed to be now follow up please so we have to do it all so now this is all about where you could able to identify now please try to identify so now this is the pectoralis major muscle you are going to identify pectoral fascia in this you could able to identify a gap so this gap is called as the retro mammary space and the remaining part of the mammary gland is going to be located so other relations of the mammary gland so now on a front view you could able to identify the mammary gland and you identify the four different quadrants and we could able to identify the axillary tail of spines so supramedial supralateral inframedial infralateral so now almost medial to third part so now this medial to third part will be occupied by a muscle the muscle is called as what pectoralis major muscle and this uh, lateral uh, one third part will be occupied by the serratus anterior muscle it is occupied by what serratus anterior muscle. and this intermediate area will be related by the external oblique so means at the back side behind the mammary gland what are all the muscles that are going to be located so now the breast lies the on the deep fascia pectoral fascia covering the muscles what are all the muscles majorly pectoralis major serratus anterior and external oblique so these are all of the relations you have to <coughs> remember and then coming to the blood supply to the mammary gland when you talk about the blood supply to the mammary gland so when you have is the four different quadrants again as same to understand uh, it supplies the upper lateral quadrant so this is our upper lateral quadrant upper lateral quadrant is supplied by a branch of axillary artery that is called as what acromiothoracic artery so please remember upper lateral quadrant is supplied by what acromiothoracic artery next lateral thoracic artery is supplying lateral part of the gland so now this half is called as the medial half this half is called as lateral half so means upper lateral that is superior lateral and inferior lateral will be supplied by the lateral thoracic artery i will repeat it so upper lateral i can call them as superior lateral quadrant is supplied by what acromiothoracic artery lateral part means total lateral half that is the superior lateral and inferior lateral are supplied by what lateral thoracic artery what is medial half so this whole half is called as the medial half that is called as the superior medial and the 
inframedial they are been supplied by the internal thoracic artery and behind the gland some perforating branches are going to be located so called as a lateral branch of the posterior intercostal arteries from the deeper aspect of the mammary gland they supplies blood so on a graph so whenever you study any blood supply or anything try to study by quadrants so superomedial inferomedial is supplied by internal thoracic artery superolateral inferolateral will be supplied by what lateral thoracic artery again super uh, superolateral will be supplied by the acromiothoracic artery and there is one more artery is that also i will show you in the next slide the acromiothoracic is over lateral thoracic is over internal thoracic over. so we are left over with the superior thoracic artery superior thoracic artery is going to supply the upper half means what superomedial and the <coughs> superolateral quadrant so this is how where we have to understand the thing so now when again when you check it over here upper means superomedial superolateral will be supplied by what uh, superior thoracic artery internal thoracic artery means what uh, superomedial and inferomedial lateral thoracic artery means what only superolateral acromial thoracic artery means uh, what uh, so we need to understand the acromial thoracic is uh, superolateral and the lateral thoracic artery will be for both the things so this is all about the blood supply to be remembered and the vein venous drainage so will be brought by circular venosus which is beneath the area like the behind nipple and areola we could able to identify a plexus of veins called as circular venosus superficial veins are draining into internal thoracic vein what is the name of the vein in the lateral sessions you will get to understand deep veins will drain into nearest vein that is called as a axillary vein to be remembered so this is called as a circular venosus so a picture which is showing the blood arterial supply and the venous drainage to be understood and then coming to the nerve supply when you talk about the nerve supply again to understand that uh, sensory nerve supply that is the sympathetic innervation will be taken by fourth to sixth intercostal nerves to be remembered so up to now we have discussed regarding the mammary gland their uh, where they are located their structure the blood supply and the nerve supply and now i would like to bring into a very other important uh, other topic called as the lymphatic drainage so lymphatic drainage of the mammary gland will be asked again as in uh, short note question separately so please try to tune into the short note also so now lymphatics means uh, the unfiltered uh, part of the lymph will be drained via through the lymph nodes in the body and uh, finally they brings back to the venous system so the lymphatic vessels are of uh, two types where you identify the superficial lymphatics and the deep lymphatics so superficial means the external part and the deep is the two internal features so superficial lymphatics of the mammary gland will drain all over the mammary gland but except the areola and the nipple so hope if you remember my statement when i was telling at the initial slides that the fact that is after removing the skin we had is the superficial fascia so the superficial fascia is present all through the aspect mainly through the structure but the fat the fat is absent at the level of areola and the nipple so here also the lymphatics are also absent that is the superficial lymphatics are not going to be located in at the level of areola and the nipple but we could able to identify the deep lymphatics so they drains all over the mammary gland and also the nipple and also the areola to be remembered also then we have studied the uh, venous drainage in the previous slides after arterial supply we, we said the venous drainage sub areolar plexus of sapi same like the circular venosus so two words please you have to remember areola nipple back side there are plexus of veins are there so those veins are called as circular venosus and that they takes away the deoxygenated blood and uh, they go back to the uh, nearest veins of the axillary vein or internal thoracic vein at the same area behind the areola and the nipple where you find uh, 
circular venous as well at the same place you identify a plexus of lymphatic channels called a subareolar plexus of sapi under the name have to be remembered and they drains the mammary gland and finally they ends at the level of axillary group of lymphoids in the axilla to be remembered so now when you take up the mammary gland so now we had a uh, hundred percentile calculation so 75 percentage of the lymphatics are now draining into the axillary group of lymph rows 20 percent of the lymphatics are draining at the median side that is called as a parasternal or internal mammary group of lymph nodes that is the medial half of the gland and the five percentage of the lymphatics are draining in the deeper aspect that is the behind the gland posterior intercostal group of lymph nodes will drain the posterior part of the gland so this is what where you have to remember 75 percentile of the lymphatics goes to axilla 20 into the parasternal 5 into the posterior so that all i will try to show it to you now and uh, let me come back to this slide back again so when you check out this image now so this midline part this one is called as the bone which is going to be located called as the sternum so now we are going to divide the mammary gland into as you already know the anatomy four parts so now this is called as the upper medial quadrant or superomedial this is inferomedial this is superolateral this is inferolateral so now the lateral most aspect of the gland where you have to understand that so to be remembered so i let me put on another color so that you will understand very clearly so now this is called as the axillary group of humors upper part means upper medial lower medial are also now draining into the axillary group even some part of the lymphatics will also drain uh, upper medial so means the 75 percentile of the lymphatics are now draining into the axillary group of lymph nodes and uh, remain 20 percent so between sternum parallelly try to observe over here lymph node lymph node lymph node so upper medial lower medial so these two quadrants are now draining into the parasternal group of lymph nodes to be remembered so only five percent that is behind the mammary gland where they are draining into so that is what i have given here 75 percent are going to the axilla armpit level 20 percent parallel so between the two mammary glands that is parasternal called as internal mammary group of lymph nodes to be remembered so please try to remember the lymphatic apart from that one there is a very important aspect the lower part of the mammary what is lower part of the mammary when we are going to take the mammary gland as a circle so now we are going to divide them into what four quadrants so assume upper medial lower medial upper lateral lower lateral so lower part means what so we have to understand the lower part to be remembered is like uh, this is our lower part do you agree my point this is lower medial and lower lateral so lower part of the mammary gland where what happens you know the lymphatics are now communicating into the abdomen so they passes uh, into the abdomen by piercing through linea alba these are the introductory words so when abdomen classes comes in you will be able to understand at that time so now they uh, you have to understand one keyword that um, the thoracic region and the abdominal region are being separated by an important muscle that is called as a diaphragm muscle to be remembered so now at the end at the midline part of the abdomen you are going to have a connective tissue that is called as a linea alba so now below the mammary gland indirectly you are going to have uh, at the chest level beneath uh, like shelf like muscle respiratory muscle called as a diaphragm so now where is this diaphragm so let me show you over here so almost so this is our mammary gland region where lungs are there so now at this level where i'm going to keep my imaginary line over here so this line level you are going to have a muscle the name of the muscle is called as what a diaphragm muscle so now from here the lymphatics are now going to be draining over here to be remembered so from here lower medial the lymphatics are passing through diaphragm lower lateral also the lymphatics are passing through the diaphragm 
and now they have entered into their abdomen. So mean the lymphatics are entering into the abdomen. After that, the lymphatics are passing beneath the diaphragm. They runs beneath the diaphragm. When they runs beneath the diaphragm, I call them as subdiaphragmatic. Means below the diaphragm is called as what sub. So subdiaphragmatic nodes, and then they passes into the liver, and the metastatic spread to the liver will leads to a disease called as obstructive jaundice. Sir, why should I need to study these lymphatics? When they are normal, they are fine enough. Suppose any cancerous cells that are located in the mammary gland, what happens here is like, especially for example, assume that in the lower medial, lower lateral cord, if any cancer cells are present, automatically they passes through the diaphragm, enters into the abdomen, they goes below the diaphragm, subdiaphragm and they goes to the liver. And now the liver is going to be affected. Leading to what? Uh, leading to a word called as the can you see the dots over here? So that is the important point where I have mentioned over here to be remember that is called as the obstructive jaundice to be remembered. So now this is the area where the liver is getting affected over here. So liver function impairs. So general jaundice is different, neonatal jaundice is different. Now this is called an obstructive jaundice where in the female once the cancerous cells are located in the breast mammary gland especially in the lower medial and lower lateral quadrant then automatically the next phase the liver is also going to be affected that is the statement it explains over here to be remembered so in the lower part the lymphatics are communicating as subdiaphragmatic lymph node they enters into the liver metastatic spread means the cancer cells are going to spread and affecting the liver to leads to obstructive jaundice. This is one way. And another way what happens, you know, once the lymphatics were been in the abdomen, again from here, one pathway we are in the abdomen, one level they have affected the liver, obstructive jaundice. Some lymphatics directly dropping down and they are affecting the uterus. Over the uterus, you have fallopian tubules are present on, on either side, which are been attached at the level of infundibulum by different ligaments. The name of the organ is called as an ovary to be remembered. So, the cancerous cells that are present in the mammary gland will traverse into the abdomen. Suppose if it is affecting liver, it may cause obstructive jam. Sometimes if it is not affecting liver, it may also affect the ovary leading to a tumor. So, the tumor occurs in the ovary leading to Krukenberg tumor also the subperitoneal drop into the peritoneal cavity occurs and the secondary means the metastatic spread is deposited onto the surface of the ovary leading to Krukenberg tumor to be remembered. So means this slide explains you that if any lymphatics are there in the upper lower medial and lower level if they are normal everything is normal but if any abnormality is there especially the cancerous cells so this part of the mammary gland any cancerous cells are present will affect either liver leading to obstructive jaundice either they may go down and they may affect the ovary leading to Krukenberg tumor in the ovary to be remembered so this is one thing I would like to remember and also I would like to take you to the uh, one more slide previously over here. So try to check it over here. 20% of the lymphatics are there, parasternal group of lymph nodes called as internal mammary group of there also I would like to explain you over here. So now at this level, so this one, this one, this one, this one are called as what? Parasternal group of lymph nodes for this side mammary gland. For this side mammary gland where they are going to be located parasternal group of lymph nodes, here we could able to find parasternal, 
parasternal 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 so this side also you are going to have the lymphatic do you agree my point the so right side is there left side is there so what you have to understand at this juncture to be remembered is like so now again i divide the mammary gland again into four quadrants here also i divide the mammary gland into four quadrants so upper medial quadrant the lymphatics will also enters into the opposite side even the opposite side lymphatics will also communicate with the opposite side quadrant means only upper medial to upper medial upper medial of the right side upper medial of the left side interchange they will communicate here also try to see lower medial is communicating with the opposite side lower medial again lower medial is communicating with the opposite side lower so there is an intercommunication between the upper medials of the right and left lower medials of the right and left if they are normal not a big deal suppose if any cancer cells that are present in the upper medial quadrant what happens automatically the healthier opposite side gland also will be affected vice versa same likewise if any cancer cells are there here in the lower middle quadrant of the left side automatically who is going to affect opposite side also so means when you are in the clinic what you have to understand here if any female is complaining with for example this is our right side this is our left side if any female is complaining on the right side upper medial and lower middle cancer cells left side is normal actually but don't try to be relaxed okay my left side gland is normal so i am safe half the way never think like that because they have intercommunications once right got affected sooner later months or days the opposite side also will be affected because the due to the communication of the lymphatics in normality so is it clear now so on a gross in a one word again i would like to uh, re refresh you for you one time so now maximum lymphatics will drains into where axillary group of about 75 percentile 20 percentile will drains into where parasternal group of lymphatics 5 percentile will drains into where back side of the gland this is normality now the same picture when the females breast is going to have cancer if the cancer cells are present on upper lateral lower lateral who is going to be affected axilla is going to be affected if the cancer cells are present on upper medial quadrant automatically opposite side is also going to be occurred same like as here also they have an intercommunication of both the sides upper medial lower medial so make sure that the opposite side of the gland also to be cross checked sometimes what happens if any cancer cells are present in lower half of the gland they may affect the liver obstructive jaundice they may affect the ovary krukenberg tumor to be remembered so this is all about the thing see how you could able to identify a cancer cells are spreading and leading to a tumor in the gland so where all lymphatics goes in that area the gland is going to be affected so now this is the gland so try to see the greenish color aspects where you could able to identify these are all are called as a lymph node these lymph nodes get enlarged so when you go meet an any nearest gynecologist so when you go for a general examination so they would like to find out that any enlargements any lump is there or they would like to identify your lymphatics so any lymph nodes got enlarged or not so make the, try to make sure that in every year of ones to have a general check up so that to have an healthier life so now what is the hormonal control of a mammary gland so the female's mammary gland will secrete estrogen hormone and they stimulates ductal system as i was explaining the mammary gland so the lactiferous ducts do you remember 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts are ending at the level of the areola and the nipple so they secrete estrogen hormone same like as i have a progesterone hormone which 
stimulates during the pregnancy phase and during the feeding phase and the alveoli are going to be formed and they are getting stimulated by a hormone called as a progesterone hormone so estrogen has an individual function to form the stimulate the ductal system progesterone hormone is having alveoli formation stimulation because the milk has to be secreted they are individual functions now i would like to bring into the together combinated functions estrogen and progesterone togetherly helps in the pregnancy phase to secretion of alveoli for the milk oxytocin hormone milk ejection reflection on the day of delivery and from the post delivery phases for the feeding of the baby so these are all about the hormonal control multiple choice questions will be asked estrogen helps in what stimulation of ductal system secretion of alveoli progesterone helps in what stimulation of alveoli secretion of alveoli oxytocin is what milk ejection reflex so uh, clinical anatomy part so generally in all females so the post later phase uh, commonest thing is breast cancer contraction of ligaments so you know suspensory ligaments of cooper are present which are dividing the mammary gland into lobes 15 to 20 lobes if they got contracted leading to skin dimpling called as puckering of the skin if obstruction of the lymphatic leads to what enlargement of the gland try to observe right and left mammary glands if one gland is getting enlarged so try to identify if edema is there means superficial lymphatic is got affected if uh, and there is another word communication of the lymphatics of the breast across the midline cancer may spread from one breast to the another that is what i was telling previously to you that is that uh, if uh, upper medial and lower medial if it is there they are communicating to the opposite side so intercommunication so superficial lymphatics will communicate leading that cancer may spread from one breast to another breast communication through uh, into the axillary group of lymph nodes so they may affect the uh, upper limb parts so there uh, through intervertebral venous plugs of beads and they uh, they infect the vertebrae brain that is now not needed at this juncture of time just as a part of things to be remember but you may know these words they may, the breast from uh, lymphatics from the breast may spread to liver leading to what obstructive jaundice the drops into pelvis in the pelvis what do you have uterus ovary so crooked bulky tumor may affect in some women more than two breast supernumerary breast shape alter shibular breast small or smaller shape so as you already know what is crooked bulky tumor if the ovary is going to be affected crooked bulky tumor so there is another uh, clinical anatomy pud orange pud orange means you try to see the mammary gland over here can you try to observe the lymphatic is got inflammated over here try to see the enlargements try to see the enlargements so all the gland is was turning into orange in color hair follicles form a lump they appear to be retract and cause obstruction of the lymphatic leading to the edema enlargement of the mammary gland at those levels what is happening the breast is going to cut turn color into what color orange in color leading to a disease called as pud orange then you come for a clinic so we need to identify pud orange any skin changes are there any redness rashes there are there any blood or anything is trickling down any dimplings are there nipple is outside or pull inside any enlargement a lump is there or not all those findings you have to find out during your uh, clinical postings to be remembered and uh, try to see it over here the female is there mammary gland is not developed at all anastia try to see here uh, polymastia polymastia means as usual apart from normal mammary gland the extra mammary gland is developed in the axilla it will make looks to wonder for you mammary gland is present below the mammary gland one more one more at this level one more at this level one more even at this level these are very rare in conditions so more than two are there i call them as what polymastia nothing is there anastia telia means what nipple mammary gland is there nipple is absent so athelia mammary gland is there many telia are there so polythelia so try to observe here supernumerary multiple number of even at the sole gland below again it is located over here so these all you could able to find out so try to identify for a lump skin dimpling color changes 
and all these things analysis will be done by mammography to be remembered so so mammary gland is a long answer as a question short courses can be asked even for the lymphatic drainage all those things to be remembered and also after now we have spoke all the way through this over for the female uh, uh, mammary gland whatever the male mammary gland there are even though in the male the mammary gland is non functional male breast cancer also can occur it looks to wonder for anyone who hears but there are five important points to be remembered for a male around the male's mammary gland any lump enlargement has occurred from the nipple blood or pus can be discharged so nipple discharge is there or not you need to find out around the nipple so retinal is there or not you need to identify nipple is actually inverted outside if anything is inverted inside need to find any skin dimpling or wrinkling is there needed to be found if these sort of symptoms are there then the male is also suffering from the male breast cancer to be remembered so this is all about the uh, mammary gland so do study well and i'll send you the material and also uh, please do watch and listen and really reason again for the uh, mammary gland class from the next anatomy channel and if any doubts are there do contact me and i am always there here for you to train it up and as syllabus ascending again so don't waste the time and do read well and uh, with this uh, for today's topic the mammary gland so we are going to sign off for today's session and uh, we'll try to see you in an uh, uh, other session with another new topic until then take care signing off daniel's anatomy